don't even know how to begin this because as we go into the scripture, amen, we're, we're confronted by the message of the cross once more. And Thanksgiving, I think there's something to be said when we look at the cross and what it stood for and, and, and look at the whole scene, amen, as we look at the cross because there's not just one, but there are three. When you look at, at the cross, what does it remind you of? Because in everything through this whole story, there is so much that we have to be thankful for, to be grateful for. I mean, when I think about this story, have you ever thought that maybe you, in your mindset, that there is plenty of time to get it right? Mm. Some of us are getting ready to visit with family and friends, and you know that in this season, in this very hour, uh, it is it is Thanksgiving could be the biggest joy in life, but they can also have confronting issues all the way through. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know that when you get to dinner, when you get among family and friends, there is times of goodness and joy, <laughs> and there's also those fights. <laughs> There is also those disagreements. There is also those times when we just feel like, you know, I've got to get up out of here. <laughs> and, and, and it's through those times, amen, that we reflect on the things, amen, that God is saying and speaking to us through the message of the cross. Amen. But I constantly am reminded and bombarded all the time with those who think that they have plenty of time to get it right. Mm. And it's so surprising that even when we confront family, even when we confront our own issues, how many times that we think that there is enough time to get it right? Now, I keep saying that, but some of you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Some of us, every Thanksgiving, we continue to be bombarded by these same issues because we harbor resentment. We harbor unforgiveness. We harbor things that should not even be there. Because for one thing, we don't even know how much time we have left. Amen. But I guarantee you that in the time, in the space, in the hour, when you find out that there is no more time left, that's when you want to get it right. Mm -hmm. Interesting to know that there, the deceitful irony about having more time is that you don't have much time. The Bible declares that your life is but a vapor. Right. And there are people that the enemy is using right now to rob people all across the world. Mm. In a second, a gunshot rings out and it takes the life of a little girl. Or it takes the life of, of somebody living on campus trying to go to school to get a good education. Or it takes the life of somebody who's just pumping gas at the gas station. But in a moment, in the wink of an eye, they're gone. And all of those people, I bet you if you asked them, they would say they have plenty of time. Mm. Time is on their side. Mm. And this is why that this time of the year can be the most joyful or the most depressing time of the year. Mm. When we think about our family and friends and those of us that are around us. See, life flashes very quickly when you find out that you only have months, weeks, or even seconds to live. Mm. We get a very different worldview of what it looks like when we know that we are out of time. Mm. Truth is that there are a lot of people out there based on this value of this story that they have up until the last moment to get it right and say, Jesus, remember me. Mm. That's not always quite the case. While the ambulance is trying to pump the chest of one who's just overdosed. Mm. He doesn't get a second chance. When I think about this month, I think about all the things, amen, considering that moment, how much I have to be grateful and thankful for. Because the, the song that constantly and I'm bombarded with is the same song we just sung a second ago. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mm. See, because I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 
Believe it or not, I wasn't always good. <laughs> Some of us have to go start digging through those old photographs to find out where we've been. Amen. You go into those old wells or caverns in our mind and we remember the things, amen, that we didn't get right. We remember the things that we used to do, the old locked doors that we swore we threw away the key. And we have the past that we can re recollect, amen, that wasn't always admirable. Some of us have done things that we should be in jail right now for. Some of us have done some really dumb stuff. Amen. Hung up with some really tricky people. I'll just say it like that. Amen. Some of us have, have gone to places we had no business going. And I think it would be right now, if it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? Mm -hmm. Often the, th the things that we should be grateful for, amen, are completely hidden from us. There are several things, amen, that they convicted Christ for, amen, but they're all true. We, amen, we see those things, but no one saw anything. Convicted, carried to the cross, hung on the cross, side by side with criminals. And as you read the text, Amen. He was convicted on so many charges. Amen. They were all true. What do you mean, Pastor? First, he was treated like a common criminal. Amen. I, Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I give him a portion among the great, that he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The title on top of his head, amen, was labeled King of the Jews. And the Bible declares that he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled before your hearing. See, it's not, not understanding, amen, that, that in the sight of these three crosses with the criminals, amen, that we don't see the our parts. Nobody saw anything. And yet the scripture is being fulfilled right before their eyes. Something that we should be grateful for. John 12 says that now is the time for judgment on the world. Now is the prince of the world to be driven out. So you have to understand that, amen, that he was a king and they were expecting a king to, to come. However, he couldn't rule the world because there was already a ruler in it. And he could not fulfill doing what he could do unless he hung on the cross. To defeat the ruler of this world. And we forget about that. Revelation 1 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king of, uh, of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen understand that he had come he had a mission to restore amen the kingdom back to himself in this world and the bible says that while he hung with criminals he was the only one that was innocent romans 5 12 says that all have sinned there is no one that has not sinned but only one who knew no sin became the propitiation for the world and although he was on the cross, and I, I keep seeing this over and over, you said, well, Jesus, the, 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 the one, amen, who was condemned said, look, Jesus, if you're all powerful, get off that cross. And he could have gotten off that cross. Why? Because he was God in human flesh. He could have called anything out. He could have came down off that cross, but he had a purpose and a mission. And rather, he made himself nothing to take on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by being obedient to death and even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above every other name. That name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And three times the Bible says and declares within this story that Jesus should save himself. Save yourself. Three times it said, save yourself. Save yourself. Save yourself. Can I tell you that most of us, that's what we think. Whatever we do, whatever we're going to, God has saved us, but we're constantly thinking, save yourself. Save yourself. Save yourself. I love what John 10, 18 says. He said, Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Amen. You have to understand what is going on in this scenario, in this scene. And I'm laying it out for you right now. Between the two criminals and Jesus being in the middle, you have to understand what one thing, the criminal mindset because although many of us have committed a crime, amen, it was Jesus that saved us from the criminal mindset. What is the criminal mindset? It's basically this. It is the criminal thinking. Mm. It includes rationalization and belief that our behavior is justified. Mm. So when you see the condemned man next to him on the cross, he tells you, save yourself and save us too. Can you imagine that if you were in a prison, amen, sitting next to the guy and he got a way of escape and he's like, look, I'm making it out. Come on with me. Why wouldn't I join up with him? Why wouldn't I escape this madness? I mean, the things that are going on. And it's this possession of trait that we take on this negative behavior of being justified for ourselves. But I keep thinking about the criminal on the other side. Because I have to wonder, which criminal am I? Because I can't stand in Jesus' place. Either I'm the one convicting Jesus, or I'm the one convincing Jesus that I'm the convict. Mm. Second Corinthians says, yet now I'm happy, not because, amen, I was made sorry, but because your sorrow led me to repentance. See, I don't think you understand that through this whole scenario, everybody could not see who Jesus was. And in the midst of everybody saying, save yourself, somehow this criminal on his right side looked at Jesus and looked at all that was presented and said, wait a minute. This man has been going around saving people. He's been telling people about his kingdom. He's been in it. He's done nothing wrong. Something is wrong with this picture. And he turns to Jesus and said, look, I don't know what they said. I don't even know what this thing means. But if your kingdom is real and true, then remember me. See, what I want to tell you about this criminal mindset is the criminal mindset keeps you locked in a portion that keeps you thinking that you're justified by what you do. And because you're justified, you can't be thankful for anything that God has done for you. Oh, my, it's quiet in here. But I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Because we have to understand that in the criminal mindset, you also have to think, amen, am I convicted or am I condemned? Because often if you're convicted, amen, and you're condemned, there are very thin, there's a very thin line between being convicted and condemned. Because we're both convicted. Both prisoners knew that they had done wrong. On one side, they asked Jesus to save them and save himself. But on the other side, the other criminal said, I just want to repent. I just want you to remember me. Mm. That's a difficult thing because, see, Lone Stubbs of Campus Ministry says, conviction and condemnation can feel very similar for a, for a Christian. Conviction is from God, and it's necessary for joy. You can't feel thanksgiving and joy without conviction if it should be cultivated. But guess where condemnation comes from? Mm -hmm. Your adversary. Anybody ever blamed you for something that you didn't deserve? And God says, that's not what I say about you. That's not what I think of you. That's not, that's not what I bring to you. 
that we are supposed to be convicted but not condemned. Jesus never condemned the criminals, but he was looking for conviction. So the only thing that can bring us conviction is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit always opens our eyes to see what is not there. He unveils the things. And so that's why the criminal on the right side could see all of these things present while the criminal on the left had blinders on his eyes because he justified himself. And instead of letting Jesus justify him, so you know what stands between the condemned and the convicted? One word, one name, Jesus. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting that standing in the middle between the condemned and the convicted is Jesus' arms open wide. So you know that a man or a woman with a repentant heart has no fear of condemnation. There is something about the Holy Spirit that helps us to see what others don't see. So when you go into Thanksgiving, when you go with your family, when you go with your friends, when you're going on the outside and you see different things going on and your heart begins to well up and you get angry, the Holy Spirit ought to show you what you're really angry about because that would mean that you're convicted. But if not, and you hold on to that grudge, then you stand condemned. Hello, somebody. I pray that this is getting through somebody. Because I want to let you know that as I was looking all these things up, I began to look at some of the, the, the convicts. And, you know, as I, as I was thinking about this, that convicts always have one last right. Most of the time, you always think of the last food that they get. And, I remember, and as I was looking things up, they was talking about the most extravagant food that somebody has ordered when they're thinking about uh, uh, their, their last day before execution. And there was one man that ordered so much food that it took him a long time to be able to eat it, hopefully delaying his, <laughs> his time, amen, to come. But there was something that, that, that really got to me and that was within the last uh, couple of months, because I think the report was just written in the last couple of months, there was a man by the name of, uh, of Riveras. And he was a convicted criminal, and he was due a man to, uh, for execution. And I asked him what his last right would be. And he said, you know what I want? And I care about the food, I care about all the other stuff. I want my pastor to hold my hand when they deliver the execution. And I thought about that for a moment because I would have to put myself back into the convict shoes who was on the cross next to him. I just want my pastor to hold my hand because if, if, if he holds my hand, there is something about touch, there is something in the power of, of, of being my pastor speaking over me during my execution that alleviates all the things that I have ever done in my life. And some of us may say in our minds, well, he deserves what he gets. Can I tell you that the man on the cross, he deserved what he got and he still got it. But the difference is he asked Jesus, forgive me, remember me when you go into your kingdom. So when I thought about the convict who asked for his pastor's hand to hold on to him during the execution, I thought about the compassion and the love and the grace that the pastor gives, amen, going through that situation. Because that is the worst point in your life when you are about to be condemned or you feel like you're condemned by all. And God said, no, you've just been convicted by your heart. And because of your repentance, I will see you in glory. Think about all the things that you have done in your life. Because the Bible declares that sin is, 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 is it leads to death. But because of Christ, you now have life. Mm. And life evermore. And that is encouraging to those who feel like they've been condemned. Condemned to die. And I can't get that out of my head. The man said, remember me. Remember me. Remember me. The only words I can remember that is what Christ said at the Last Supper. 
before he was convicted to die. What did he say to the church? Remember me. And all we're asking today is, Lord, remember me. I'm grateful and I'm thankful for you, for the church, and for all that he has done for me. But all I'm asking is that you would Please remember those that are in prison, those that are incarcerated, those that are going through this Thanksgiving. Amen. As we remember that we were once convicted and condemned, but now we have life evermore in Christ. Mm -hmm. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm -hmm.